Greetings, fellow insomniacs. It's your friend and Frank. Good old Chunky Larry welcoming you to another episode of Creature Features, wherever you listen to podcasts and on YouTube. And we are fully immersed into the season of summer. We are talking all about summer camp horror with this theme this month, summer camp nightmare. And you can't do a summer camp themed month and not talk about the film that we're going to be talking about today. This is, when you think of all of the summer camp horror movies, probably the first one that people will reference when talking about summer camp horror movies. And it is peak 80s in so many different ways, but it also has one of the most complex subplots that is full of conversation and if i'm going to have a conversation about a very uh polarizing horror film there's only one person that i want to talk to when i'm when i'm having that conversation if you follow me on tiktok you see the verbal jousts that i have with this man on a daily basis almost he is a fucking maverick in the world of podcasting, social media. He does it all. He is doing multiple episodes and different styles of episodes within his own universe of the You Run podcast. Uh, this this dude has true crime. He has television. He has horror reviews. And he has an, an entire network of shows outside of his show. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm thrilled to finally have on the Creature Features podcast, good friend of mine from the You Run podcast, Scott. How you doing, my man? I'm good. That is the biggest sell for me I've ever heard. Thank you so, (laughs) so much. I I feel uh, I'm sitting here going, is that me? That doesn't sound like me. (laughs) It's totally you. That's, Uh, That's been my perception of you for the longest time. And that's why one of the things that you and I do I think is we go back and forth where we don't necessarily see things in the same way, but we have these respectful debates constantly, usually about uh, remakes. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And so I want to talk to you right now about the idea of remaking Sleepaway Camp. What do you think? I think it could be done. I think there are lots of challenges in remaking this with how it would be perceived with the way the world is now. Mm -hmm. So the way this movie is done, it is very much a pushed identity on a character. And I don't know how well, if that was remade and re-released with the same narrative, I don't know how well that would be received. It could be done, but it's a very tricky movie to get that balance right and to please everybody. It's a very, this is one of the hardest movies to remake, which is why it probably hasn't been touched because studios look at it and go, no, that's a headache that I do not want. Absolutely. So we're going to get into this, but this film, more so than a lot of the other films that have been remade, has have a very particular identity associated with that film and there are elements of that of the film that we're going to be discussing that you you can listen to anyone who brings this up and the the word problematic comes up more often than anything else when discussing sleepaway camp so to remake that with modern sensibilities and and create something that is going to not only appease the current audience, but appease the audience of the originals. It's next to impossible. Yeah. And to do that without offending certain people is, is going to be like to do this movie now and make it non-offensive is an almost impossible task. It's so challenging to tackle the issues that this does and not make it, well, you're right. Problematic. 
it yeah. is problematic for studios. A studio exec will look at this, go, oh, let's remake Steepaway Camp. They'll rewatch it and go, no, let's let's not remake that at all because we'll, <laughs> we'll we'll end up in so much shit. Let's not do that. Yeah, no, and like this is this is. There's been a couple of films uh, that we've discussed that have you know been in the place where it's specifically in this month where they age poorly because of people associated with them i'm specifically talking about the burning uh yeah. you know and and that gaze that they have on youth in a in a way that's kind of yucky um and and that's in this as well and so it's like you know remaking the burning you can get rid of all of that remaking sleepaway camp you can't get rid of any of it because it's integral to what that movie is about yeah uh, but we're we're gonna just be talking about this so we might as well get this portion out of the way uh we have to go to the world of the endables and we scour and find the wordiest version of a synopsis for sleepaway camp and i'm going to read that to you now after a horrible boating accident kills her family shy sullen angela moves in with her eccentric aunt martha and protective cousin ricky one summer martha sends the kids to camp arawak soon after their arrival bizarre increasingly violent accidents claim the lives of various campers who is the twisted individual behind these murders? The disclosure of the murderer's identity is one of the most shocking climaxes in the history of American cinema. And that was written by Drew, and if you give your name, we give you credit. And Drew did a pretty fucking good job. He didn't, you know, lay everything Spoiler. out. No, he, but, he uh, did a good job. Yeah. Uh, so I, I almost feel kind of bad playing this game, but we're going to play it fucking anyway. <laughs> uh, a lot of the times with these synopsises, not in this particular situation, they give away all of the major plot points of the film rather than just enticing somebody to watch a movie. So I've created this game. It's called Synopsis Obscura. And what I need from you, Scott, is for you to, without saying anything, sell us on sleepaway camp and make it sexy well uh, uh, ew, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 ooh, uh. go ahead yeah okay uh, uh, yeah, mm, okay uh, the thing is that synopsis was really kind of spoiler free that was kind of he's stolen what i was gonna say let me see what i can come up with um after a tragic family event our main character is sent to a summer camp where she spends time with her friends but they're not really her friends they're mean to her and when you're mean to people karma comes around and bites you and in this case it does it in excellent ways this movie will leave you stunned shocked and probably in silence when the movie comes to a close that, that's as good as i can do i think that was that was actually really really fucking good um okay so uh Having podcasters on the show, uh, they're ready for my fucking tricks. So fucking <laughs> a. All right, okay, okay. We're we're gonna just get this out of the way, and I, I feel like in order for us to have this conversation, we're just gonna we're just gonna unfurl the dick, and I think yeah. it's important to just it, get it out of the way. And it, it, you know, it's a good place to start. You you don't want to unfurl the dick midway through. Let's let's do it now. And... Yeah, let's just unfurl the dick and we'll we'll fucking be able to actually have a conversation. So this this film is predicated largely on its ending and I've already warned you before we even started this conversation that this is going to be real with spoilers, but in order for us to have a conversation about this movie, just understand this is going to get spoiled. This film from 1983, this 40 fucking one year old film is going to get spoiled right now. So if you haven't seen this movie, 
she's got a dick okay yeah. <laughs> angela has a dick let's let's just get it out of there let's just get it off our chest you, you do you feel better scott now that yeah I, I i feel better and i feel that now we've we've done that i think it's also important to say that for me i don't see angela as necessarily a trans character this is a character who's had an identity forced on this is not someone who's made a decision a decision to identify as a girl this is someone who has been told they're going to identify as a girl and i know in the sequels they kind of flush all that down the toilet and doing a whole other thing but in this movie this is not a trans character this is this is a a man this is a boy who's been made to act and behave and present themselves as a girl and when you watch it through that lens it's a really harrowing story this poor boy went through it's like this is a horrible horrible story absolutely thank you for fucking because uh, that's that's what this is this is not you know, Robert Hiltzik painting someone being transgender as uh, a despicable thing. Somebody being forced against their will to be something is a despicable thing. And it, yeah. it causes a mental break within Peter that he's not able to differentiate who he is and he's in a room full of girls of course he's going to because he's a 13 year old boy yeah who's been forced by his aunt to live the life of a girl and rather than you know because he doesn't know any other way he's angela because that's what he's been forced to be when he gets away from the the grasp of aunt martha he's still angela because this is eight years of yeah someone being fucking told since they were a little child that they are this girl and you see when they have the conversation because a lot of people you know when when, the, when you're looking at this film a lot of people are there it's like a magic trick almost because you see aunt martha and she's this colorful thing and she looks like you know matilda or whatever the fuck right uh, but madeline or whatever the fuck uh, but she's she's also kind of wacky so you don't focus on angela peter the way that they react when she refers to her or him as her little girl yeah the the way that they fucking freeze and shiver and like there you you can see a shudder and it's it's subtle as fuck but because they're so you're so blinded when you're watching it by this absurd character you yeah. don't see it yeah and, and it's, it's it's very wizard of ozzy that character is that kind of bright pop vibrant color and they always focus in on her face and she's always doing some weird gestures with her really heavily lipsticked mouth and it's yeah everything else around that character is almost in the background and it's done deliberately and it's done really really well yeah and it is like legitimately a bait and switch visually when you're watching the film you're you're focus is naturally on that so you don't see the subtleties of what is actually happening is it's this woman abusing this child yes to not understand what their actual identity is and so then that conflict plays out inside of the summer camp the the conflict is am i a girl or am i a boy there's a, there's a point in they're in the rec hall and angela shoots the yeah the fucking candy wrapper into the trash can they're like oh that's a really good shot and it's like it's a boy yeah. <laughs> and 
you know, uh, athletically inclined and just like afraid to show or express who they are for fear of being, you know, revealed as who they are. And, and it's just, that shit is fucking wild to me because I think a, a, a lot of the times this film gets shit on and, and gets like, Oh, this is a stupid fuck. I, I don't see it that way though. No. And, and this movie is not like it. There, there are movies that do portray people who are transgender or gay in a negative light. A, a prime example is silence of the lambs, Buffalo bill. Yeah. It's very much a, this is a gay character, therefore he's inherently evil. And that's kind of the way that that comes across. But in this movie, they don't do that. And I really appreciate the fact they don't do this. Like all the way through this, I, I root for Angela all the way through. And even, even in the closing scenes of this movie, I'm kind of like, well, yeah, I kind of get it. Like you've, you've had a fucked up life. I get why you're the way you are. I understand. And at no point am I like, oh, you're the villain, you're the big bad, because they're not. And so that also is an interesting part of this film, is that it's done in a way that you're supposed to actually empathize with the killer. And, you know, the people that are being killed are being punished for their cruelty to this person. So, like, again, if just watching this on the surface level you see you know these are kind of mean kids and they're getting picked off and clearly it's got something to do with angela and ricky yeah and ricky in this is fucking great because he's an incredible red herring in the sense that he's just quick to violence but i have a theory and i want to know how you feel about this if Aunt Martha is a, as abusive as she is, even though Ricky's able to escape and go to his father's house for periods of time, he is stuck in that house with his mother for periods of time. Yeah. Is it possible that she created two killers? Yeah, 100% it is. It, 100%. Know, I and mean, she's built... Uh, because we don't know how the aunt made the children comply. But oh. when you look at her, I don't think she made them c comply by asking them nicely. This is someone who is mentally, and I would probably say physically abusive, which shows off in the characters because they are violent as well. Like these, yeah. these things that happen to you, to us as children shape the way that we behave. So you tend to find that, Lots of kids will come from homes where they got beaten will end up smacking their kids. Not in all cases, but as a general rule, like we see it all the time when we do true crime cases. If you look at a really horrific serial killer who's incredibly violent and you go back and you look at their childhood, it was incredibly abusive. And yeah, I think 100% she could have created two killers and they should have explored that. 100% they both should have been killing in this movie. I think that they were. Oh, really? Yeah, I think that they were both doing the killing. Because if you really look at the timelines and, and like you lay out when people are getting killed, where Ricky and Angela are, because they're always kind of not around. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so Ricky, very much like Angela, is presenting for his specific, you know, gender so he's presenting masculine things he's really good at baseball he's wearing an oversized fucking cowboy hat he's just like he's supposed to be like a like a dude's dude and yeah. angela is very kind of uh i mean she's obviously quiet but she's dainty in her mannerism she's constantly holding her hands over her lap which could be something in and of itself uh, but she's in her movements and her nature, even when she opens up to Paul, uh, she is very feminine. She, she pushes feminine. And so they're both displaying 
for what they're supposed to present as. And I, again, I just think that if that is a dynamic that is beaten into her over or him over eight years, there's no way that it's not also beaten into Ricky. No, it, I agree. I think that's, yeah, you've got a valid point as well, because we never see any of the kills take place. Well, we see the kills take place, but we only ever see hands and, and both the of their hands. hands. Yeah. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Because Jonathan Tiersten, who played Ricky, was actually the hands of the killer. And he oh. shot all the stuff with the hands. So it, it adds to it. It's also him standing in the doorway when Judy is fucking killed uh, with a wig on. It's Jonathan Tiersten. And, you know, in the cleaner version of the film, you can see him. And it's like, okay, well, that's that's Ricky right there. It, it's, yeah. That's Ricky. It's not... And part of that was because uh, Felissa Rose's mom was very hands-on with Felissa. It, that sounds so fucking bad talking about. Yeah, that, that, you, you need um, to rephrase that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 she, she, she's, she's very uh, outspoken, involved, involved yeah. in, in the way that she's used on, God damn it. <laughs> the, the, way the way that she's portrayed on screen. Portrayed on screen. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Uh, and so she made she put it in the mandates when she was signing on to do the film that uh it would not be her doing any of the killing, not physically her doing any of that stuff. Because she didn't want her daughter doing that kind of stuff. And so They have Jonathan Tiersten do it, and it just adds credence to the fact that both of them were doing the killing. Yeah, because it's even in the the final scene that is a um, that's one of the college guys who was on set who they got wildly drunk yeah. to stand there and and do that. Which again, that's right because when they done this, that they were all the right age. This isn't like a modern Hollywood production where everyone's thirty five and they're pretending to be sixteen. So these uh, kids were that age. Jonathan Tiersten was seventeen at the time that they made the film. Felissa Rose was thirteen. Yeah, and uh, they dated during the course of the filming. Oh, really? Did you know that? No, I didn't. Yeah. Uh, so they had a a brief relationship that w was only kissing because there were certain things that Felissa wasn't allowed to do because she was 13 years old but yeah yeah that was that was a thing that happened during the course the, the, the whole production was really like summer camp in a way they were all eating at the in the rec hall and they were you know working together and kind of developing this bond and you see it on the screen. You see yeah. it with every single character. It feels more authentic because it is kids instead of fucking 30-year-olds pretending to be teenagers so they can get naked. Yeah. And, uh, okay, let's talk about it. Let's well, talk about Art the Cook. Oh, oh. Oh, never has a movie created a character that I hated so much, so quickly. Like the first words out of his mouth, I'm like, you need to die like right now. Someone yeah. needs to take you out. Like, and I think what makes it worse is like everyone he works with is like, oh, you're so funny. But no, that's not funny. How the yeah, fuck is that funny? That's really fucking suspicious, my guy. You're in a camp full of children and you're saying we like to call them baldies. Like, what the yeah. shit did you just say? <laughs> yeah and it's like no one seems to care and like it's glaringly obvious to uh, to me us as an audience but it must be glaringly obvious to everyone who works there as well and there's still parts where they're like oh come with me you can meet the chef and i'll leave you all on your own in here with the cook because i know he's a pedo but you'll be fine it's it's, it's fine don't worry like so much of like that whole dynamic like him 
and how he is with Angela and how he is just in general just like repulses me. And but like I, when he comes out of the fucking storage locker and he's fastening his pants and children are running out and Mel looks at him and he like it's like that's weird but doesn't fucking do anything about it. Yeah. Because I, Mel is a piece of shit. Yes. Who only cares about the fucking bottom line. And the bottom line is Mel deserves something really awful to happen to him. Like, I don't know, maybe an arrow through his neck or something. <laughs> there are times where Mel says stuff and I kind of sort of have a little chuckle because people who own these sorts of businesses, there are people like Mel that actually exist that will turn a blind eye to things as long as the money's coming in. When something goes wrong, we'll stand there with the policeman and go, but it was an accident, right? Yeah. Uh, we need we need we need to do the autopsy. But you you think it's an accident because if you say that when it goes to court, I can stand there and go, well that policeman said it's an accident. So I'm gonna dispute the coroner's report now. It's it's like these people are real. The those sort of people exist. And and it goes even further because he's like a hundredy and he's having a fucking relationship with Meg M E G. Yeah, like, but what? But why does Meg want to have a relationship with this guy? Like, I can't wrap my head around that from her perspective either, because he's not. This is not like a an older George Clooney style looking guy. Like, I can get that, but he's an he's a fugly old man. And but Meg's not, like not even that. Like, she was a camper easily a year or two ago. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, like. What the fuck are you doing, Mel? And, yeah. and that's okay. Yeah, the the thing is, all of the characters are questionable as well. Who's the who's the understudy cook? The one who takes over? I can never remember his name. Ben. Yeah, yeah. even Ben is a bit of a dick because he knows everything that's going on. He knows that Mel's an asshole. He knows that the cooks are pedophile, and he does nothing. He just sits there and bides his time because he knows at some point. The cook's going to fuck up. He's going to get his job, get a nice pay bump. And he's just he's just completely complicit in everything that's going on. And it Bro, aggravates when, me. When he's like, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, he's gone. Let's just have about a $50 raise. Just make sure that you tell him if they ask, he got a job somewhere else. Oh, yeah, sure. I'm yeah. James Earl Jones' dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the whole like the whole setup of the campers, like this group of people who run this camp make Crystal Lake look like the most organized shit going on. Like, I don't know. <laughs> Steve Christie was kind of handsy feelies too. Uh, this, so, this is true. Yeah. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, maybe so, they should go into business together. Yeah, maybe, maybe the, the takeaway from all of these things is that summer camp's just not a good place for kids. <laughs> yeah, just don't send don't send your kids to summer camp. <laughs> but let's let's get into fucking reapers for this thing because I feel like we could we could literally talk about you know the rights and the wrongs of uh, the gender politics of this film. But I, I I really for me I think that it's it's done and it and it, it is expressed and I think that. It is one of those things that's misconstrued a lot of times when people are talking about this film. Yeah. But again, I, I feel like it's it, it would be kind of beating a dead horse at this point because uh, honestly, I think, you know, it's like if if you really look at the movie, if you really take a second and you look at what the movie is trying to say you'll you'll realize that it's not you know transgender people are bad it's this person is a victim and they're reacting to being yeah. a victim and the victims become victimizers and, and it's not an excuse for what they're doing but it is ultimately the motivation for why they're doing it not that they're transgender or anything like that it's it's that they've been abused and, and yeah that i think is the part that i feel is just lost when people look at this movie 
Yeah, and I don't understand why it's lost. So like, I see, I looked at loads of people who've reviewed this, loads of podcasts I've listened to, and that conversation of they're portraying transgender people as bad people comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. And I never got that from this movie, not on a first watch, not on a rewatch. I've always seen it as Angela responding to the trauma that she's been put through. It's not like she's not identifying as a as a woman she is being told you are a little girl you are going to do this this is not open for discussion she's not a bad person her aunt is a bad person and, and there's another part where paul and angela are kissing on the beach and paul is feeling angela up yeah and it goes to this flashback of angela and peter watching her dad's in bed together and yeah. then them in bed and peter's pointing at angela and it's i believe again this is just from my interpretation of what this movie is is that being peter saying you know i'm a boy in here and you know it's it's like that does does this make me gay am i gay yeah uh, you know i'm dressed like a girl i'm kissing a boy like my dad does that mean that i'm gay and it, it's not it's not like a nightmare it's a conflict because he has been put through all of this for fucking eight years and he doesn't yeah. know how to understand it or or, or you know make peace with it and it's it's i i just I, it's i feel like it's such of that so much of that is lost on people yeah, when they watch this but i don't understand how it's lost because it is really spelled out very clear it's it's a really clear well contrived way that they tell that part of the story that part of the plot is kind of integral to everything and when i listen to people talk about it and they've completely missed it all that goes through my head is like you need to go and fucking sit down and pay attention and not doom scroll your phone while you watch this movie and actually look at what you're being shown yeah that that, that is ultimately i think what it boils down to is that people are doing doing this while they're watching the movie yeah and you know it, it you could attribute that to pace but i don't think that this is poorly paced no i don't it, it has moments where it lulls but it lulls for we're talking seven eight minutes at a time and then it's back up again this is by no means something like midsummer that you spend three and a half hours going yeah this Come is on, 84 let's go. fucking minutes dude yeah like, <laughs> so fucking... what are we talking about you can't <laughs> fucking pay attention to the screen for 84 minutes and four <laughs> of those minutes is probably the fucking trailer or the credits yeah <laughs> and uh you know i complaining about the baseball like I grew up in the eighties. Baseball was a big fucking thing. Well, like, well, I do. I do have one complaint about the baseball, and that is those fucking shorts. They are the <laughs> shortest fucking shorts. <laughs> like how nothing fell out of those shorts is beyond me. They are so short. Uh, I love that line. Uh, Eat shit, die, Ricky. Eat shit, and live, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> love that shit. Uh, it, I don't know, dude. Like. To me, this has this has all of the right things, uh, yeah. but uh, let's get into fucking Reapers for this bad boy. How are you coming in? Zero being the lowest, five being the highest. This sits around a four for me. I, I really like this movie. It's not a perfect movie. It has it has some issues. It's dated a little bit in places with some of the the effects that are used but it's a good movie it's a solid horror movie and for a, a camp slasher this is up there really up there i i love this movie i i completely agree i'm going to come a little bit higher than you i'm going to go with a 4.5 out of 5 i i just think that this is a perfect fucking horror movie i think that this is this is one that i watched really early on into my love of the horror genre and i was like 12 maybe 13 when i saw it for the first time and so 
you know, you're in your teen transition where you're deciding who it is that you are as a person. So it, it hits directly into that. And yeah, you know, you see the representation of somebody that's your age on the screen and they're going through things that you're particularly going through and for it to have that fucking twist. And it just, that twist does sit with you. And I, I, I see a lot of people that say that this movie is solely the twist. And I, I disagree with that. I think that this movie is way more than just the twist of, you know, it being Peter and not Angela. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that the violence is fucking excellent. The, the burn with the cook is incredible and uh who needs a pot of water that big there that is the biggest pot of water <laughs> ever uh the the snake coming out of the mouth that shit's dope dude like i fucking love this shit. yeah uh, he's like you know watch out for the water snakes and then the snake like that's fucking dope dude yeah uh, the, cur the curling tongs are great that's a that's a oh my god moment as well yeah and, and it's like there's just so much fucking violence that they they do that feels like okay i could see a kid doing something like this yeah what yeah, was the, your favorite kill in the movie it is the, it's the boiling pot of water for me i think that's fabulous um and i like the fact that all the kills are varied there's only one kill in this i would say is a sort of traditional slasher kill and that's yeah. the kill in the shower yeah. everything else is unique i mean how how many movies have you seen someone killed with a set of curling tongs uh, how many times have you seen a pedophile thrown headfirst into a pot of boiling water while he's standing on a ladder like this stuff doesn't happen in other horror movies and i really appreciate that they didn't just do a carbon copy of every other slasher movie at the time how do you feel about the kids getting hacked up with the hatchet ah uh, it's it's horrific but it works for this movie and it works for the killer having that sort of the point where they've they, they're broke there, there is no coming back and it's like that they know so they've got to go i think that's how i view that uh, so that's that's a good way to look at it um i think that if you look at the deaths that happen kind of with the kids and Paul, they don't really deserve any kind of, no, you know, reproach like somebody like uh, the cook deserves. I, I don't even think Judy, yeah, she's a bitch, but getting a fucking curling iron in the hoo hoo. Yeah. That's yeah. I, I love the way that they do that though, with the fucking silhouettes against the wall, as opposed to just like being grotesque with it and showing it. And they do that with a lot of the violence. It's it's a lot of aftermath. And I think that that's a fucking smart touch. The only actual violence that you see is the arrow going in the neck, which is a hell of a gag. You know, because yeah. even when Meg is being killed, you see, you know, her up against the wall kind of going like this. But then on the other side of the wall, you see the knife and the blood, but it's not like knife going into body. It's knife going into wall and yeah. there's blood coming out of the wall. Um, yeah. And again, then they show you the after effects afterwards when she's laying on the floor and she's got the, the cut down her back. Yeah. And I, I, the, the makeup effects for me for this film are just top fucking notch. And it, again, there's a lot of imagination that has to go into a film like this because there's just so much that like people see just the ending and they don't see you know all of these intricate fucking kills because you know a beehive getting put into a fucking toilet isn't like intricate in the, the in, in the grand scheme of how to kill someone but the execution of it is intricate because yeah. again, it's it's what you're not seeing, and then the after effects, and that was also fucking really cool because they just put uh, sugar on a dummy's head, and the bees just went nuts for it, and yeah, as uh, that shit is fucking dope to me. Yeah, I, I love 
I love the use of effects where they're done in this way. They're done in a, a very thought out and controlled way. So like you look at lots of, be it effects that are done practically or visual effects, a lot of effects in bigger budget movies tend to be quite lazy. They're, they're very much a, we can do this, so we'll just do that. When you get a smaller movie like this, there's a lot more effort, a lot more care, and a lot more time put into everything to make. Like th there was a moment on that set where they all stood there and went, "How the fuck do we get the bees to go on that head? How mm -hmm. do we make that work?" And there's a trial and error process behind that, and I really appreciate that over someone like in a modern movie. Just let's just draw some some bees over that head, and we'll animate them, and it, it it'll look it'll look okay, and people yeah. won't mind. And I like I, I prefer the the practical approach to effects as opposed to cgi effects i think yeah. that's 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 a a product of growing up in the 80s and 90s though and that's what we had that's what i my likes are linked to i think well also i think that there's a tangibility that comes with special makeup effects prosthetic makeup effects and creature effects as opposed to you know computer generated animation because not only can you feel it as an audience member, the actor can feel it as an actor and yeah. just like, Ooh, you know, yes, you're a good actor. You can do, Ooh, but violence when you're actually having blood splattered on you and you're seeing something get ripped open in front of you creates a completely different reaction than. Ooh. Yeah, then look at this tennis ball. Yeah. When the movie's done, this tennis ball's going to explode all over you, and we'll put all the guts on you afterwards. It's a lot harder to react to that than it is to, right, we've made this mannequin. In about three seconds, it's going to explode and fire gunk all over you. It's a very different reaction and behavior. And even fucking Angela's revealed to be Peter at the end, where they get like a it's like a wax mask that they put on this fucking dude and have him kind of just hold this pose. And that's effective because it yeah. feels kind of weird and otherworldly and feral. And the sound that's kind of that growl that's coming out of them as that's happening, it just, it, it's so horrifying with the music and everything. And it's not, horrifying oh my god it's a boy it's more horrifying like look at what has been become of this person they are no yeah. longer a person like that fracture happens and they're snapped and it and it you see it where angela's sitting and she's rubbing paul's head and she's humming and it, and again that that feels like uh a reaction response to trauma of just yeah. trying to soothe, trying to soothe and it being interrupted. And it just, you know, there is that true face of just a broken soul. And I just, I don't know, man. I think that this fucking movie is brilliant. Yeah, so. I do. And really underappreciated as well. I I'm going to say it. This does not get the love that it deserves. It gets a lot of hate. And yeah. and I think that it's just short sighted, being terribly honest. Yeah, I agree. But let's get let's get the fuck out of here, man. Because I, like I feel like we could talk forever, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Plugs, my man. So uh, tell people where they could find you and the show. Uh, we're really easy to find. You run podcast dot com. That's got links to all of our social media. Um, TikTok is one that I'm on regular. You'll see me arguing with Larry pretty yeah. much on on the daily. Um, Instagram is probably our our main hub. That's where you can go and vote for what movies you want us to cover, what true crime cases you want us to cover. But yeah, you run podcast.com's got absolutely everything. So yeah, he head there and you'll find out everything you need to know about us, and you'll find all the other shows that are under the network banner as well. So. And they do something really cool that I just want to point out. Uh, Scott, for every episode, he does something called TikTok Talks, where he gives people the opportunity to just kind of voice off 
with what they think about the film and if you like the sound of my voice you'll hear me fucking chastising certain films that they decide to cover and uh, <laughs> praising others uh, but also they do something really cool on their Instagram and uh, their X which is three word review It's you do it on yeah. threads as well right yeah threads and slasher and Facebook and yeah everywhere else <laughs> yeah so get to know these guys because their show is completely fucking interactive and it's fucking fun because it's embracing the horror community in a way that a lot of other horror podcasts don't do so go out of your way fucking follow them on all of their socials but if you're here just for scott because you're a fan of your run podcast which i do not blame you but you've enjoyed the conversation that me and him have had you want to find out more about me and creature features you can do that in a couple of different ways you can start by liking us on facebook facebook.com forward slash creature pod by following us on twitter and instagram and tiktok and youtube at creature pod at creature pod for all of our social media that is the best way to find us um i do every horror 24s basically i'm watching every single horror movie that is released this year and uh i'm not as up there with all of my reviews but i'm i'm fucking going for it and i'm watching all of these fucking horror movies the good the bad the scalpers and uh that's something that you can get yourself invested in. You can also keep an eye out for Dylan and Chunky's Horrifying Tales of Horror. That is a new podcast that I'm working on as of right now that I think is really fucking cool. It's a little fucking oh, over this way, a little over that way. Uh, definitely look out for that. And we will be back next week with the conclusion of Summer Camp Nightmare. We are going to be talking about summer camp nightmare and this is going to be a fucking really fun conversation because this is one of those hidden 80s horror gems that people don't really talk about and i'm excited for my guest and for this conversation so go out of your way find summer camp nightmare give it a watch because we will be spoiling the shit out of that motherfucker but for scott and for myself again my name is chunky this has been another episode of the Creature Features Podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts and on YouTube, listen. Something you trust. <laughs> <laughs>